Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Conscious Vibe Podcast, where we elevate intellect through conscious dialogue while exploring race, politics, business, and culture. I'm Dr. Daryl L. Jones, and I'm Charles D. Mitchell. DJ, what's up, man? What's going on? All is well. We have we have our last guest of season, season three. Three is crazy. Last guest of season That's three, right. and you know who that is? My man, Joe Fogg. Well, that's not that's not saving the best for last, guys. <laughs> what are you doing? Like they should have been first. Look, look, you, you, look. We handpick everybody. So the fact that you're last, the last will become first, my friend. This is how it works. I'm more of an opener guy. I'm an opener. I'm, I'm like getting people warmed up for you know for the main event. But I'll be the main event. I'm excited to be the main event. Uh, uh, I gotta tell you. Joe, um, and I, I'll do a little quick introduction. Joe, I met Joe through a good friend of ours, actually one of Sherry's best friends growing up, who used to live here in Phoenix, moved back home to, to Oregon. She and her husband at the time were Joe and his wife, Heather's next door neighbors, I believe. That oh, got it. And yeah. Joe, Joe is, I'm trying to describe Joe. I think I, I, Joe is like, I've never seen anybody like him when he's at this, he's an energizer bunny, right? He's got like okay. this, his energy that never quits. And he has more ideas than anybody I've known when it comes to how to take a business and like literally take one concept around what you do and like make it apply to like a hundred different things. Got it. Right. To add value in that service. office. I won't steal your thunder for too much longer, Joe. But we we got introduced to Joe because Joe's, you know, what he's building at the time, which he has been able to expand and grow, which is going to be a tremendously successful company, uh, moved into, was moving into a dental staffing space. And since, you know, we're in staffing, mm -hmm. Molly was like, you got to meet Charles and Sherry, you got to meet Joe. And it was like a brother from another mother, the moment we met. And uh, I've had the great pleasure of getting to know Joe over the last four years you know, being a part of the work that he's doing at On Dam, and and Joe, I'll let you take it from there. Again, Joe Fogg, CEO of On Dam. Welcome, Joe, Joe. Give us a little intro. Tell us about yourself. Tell us about On Dam, the work, the work you're doing, what you've built, and uh, then we'll just we'll just start talking. I, I love it. Well, thanks. I mean, you're too kind for for saying those things. I think part of it is, um, yeah. So just quick introduction. Yeah, my name's Joe Fogg. Yeah, we uh, Charles, we have been partnered on this venture, and. Uh, it's so fun and stressful and exciting and scary all at the same time, but it it's amazing too at the same time. I think part of what you, I learned early on, kind of what my, it's, it's a blessing and a curse. Like I get obsessed with just solving problems. So I'm not an engineer. Um, I've attended many colleges. I never completed those co colleges because you get, wrapped around ideas on how to make things better, more efficient, optimize the experience. And then I'm super competitive. So I wasn't gifted with, um, I mean, I think I can beat Charles in a game of horse. It hasn't happened yet, but I'm going to, um, it's going to be fun to see that happen. And he's, he's, a little, he's a little delusional too. So <laughs> no, it's okay. We'll, 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 we'll work with that. It, it's funny. Like part of this is even part of this, is part of the mental strategy where I'm already starting to play games with Charles when I say that, because he doesn't know, maybe Joey's going to get it. I don't know. But so I, I love strategy. He sent, me, he sent me one video of him making a three point shot. Now well, he's he's like, I, I, I don't know. I think he, I think he like made it up actually. You know, he's a tech guy, you know, so I've got it. I think he framed the, the jump shot to actually going through the basket. I don't think it's, so it, it was, it was a three pointer, but he was right. He goes, how many shots did that take? Because I only sent him the clip where I made it. And I was like, oh, damn it. He replied back too fast with, with that because he was so true because it wasn't the first one. Um, but part of it's strategy. I love I loved strategy, right? So if I could be, you know, I love, uh, you know, Chip Kelly when he was at the Oregon Ducks and now he, he's at UCLA and I know they lost to the Ducks. But, but that offensive strategy on how you line up your team against the other team, what are your strengths and what are their weaknesses? And I just love applying that same strategy and that concept for speed to scale a business 
whatever that business is from a go-to-market strategy. Like how do you differentiate your product, your go-to-market strategy? And, and then you do a competitive analysis of your competitors and find out what their weaknesses are. And you look at your strengths. And then you look at adjacent markets, like what's happening with technology in other markets. And you're like, damn, that's a great idea. I don't need to reinvent the wheel, but let's bring that concept into what we're doing here and try it out. So that's what I love doing. And um, when you can, similar to sports, right? You want to win games, right? You, you can't win the game if you don't show up on the field. And if you don't practice, you're not going to be ready and prepared for the game. What is this? I'm like the five P's. What are the five P's? You probably know what they, know what they are. Like, product, I thought it was the four P's. <laughs> product. <laughs> uh, piss, piss poor planning. Or wait, proper planning prevents piss poor performance or something like that, right? About the different okay, P's yeah. here, clearly. But yes, you're right. Something like that. Sorry, I don't mean to bleep or edit this. I don't mean to. But in that, part of I look at it is this doing that work of researching what's working, what's not working, and then finding a niche and a need to where you can bring that to market. Um, but those are, I lack so many other skills. <laughs> um, uh, and so part of what's breeding success is knowing what you're lacking and knowing who can shore up those abilities far better than you have. And then it's my wife, I always talk about, like, I love TV shows and movies and that kind of stuff. But what makes it really, really good is someone who I compare similar to a coach is like the casting director. Right? When you find that person that is so good in this role for this movie or show or whatever that compliments this person, right? together than when they make magic, right? It's like Steph Curry, he's not, no one cares how many rebounds Steph Curry gets. He's, he's, the, he's an awesome point guard shooting and, and passing, right? But he can't win all by himself. You have to bring a cast of people that are so awesome in their skill set, and then together, it's magic. So when I was starting on DM, I didn't know staffing. I didn't know a damn thing about staffing. I had no clue. I just had an idea on how to leverage technology in a marketplace that needed it. And I was asking Sherry, or Sherry heard what we were, not Sherry, uh, Molly knew what we were doing. And I was like, I gotta find somebody who's staffing. She's like, oh, you would get along great with my friend, uh, Sherry, her husband, uh, Charles. Like he's, he's awesome. But then I looked him up and I was like, oh my God, this guy's got more degrees than I have years in school and college. <laughs> well, I got, I, I was a little intimidated to talk to him. I was like, and then he's so humble. I was like, Oh my God, is this the right Charles? Like you got all these, you're like, you're a nice guy. You're not even, when I meet Charles, if I would have, sorry, I'm probably rambling too much right now, but if I was Charles right now, the Charles I, is this. <laughs> <laughs> um, like when we, when we would do pitches to raise money, I was like Charles's hype man. You would think he was coming out to walk onto a boxing ring and I was the, what do they call it? The, the MC guy, like setting it up. I was like, I'm excited to introduce you to my business partner, Charles. One, he's got, he'll never say this. He's too humble and you never do say it. Uh, you know, he, he has a, a, a law degree from this school, an MBA from this school, a, a management degree from this school. And I name them all. I go, if it was me, I would have a Harvard hat on with the North Carolina TV <laughs> on. With, with a, I would be a walking billboard of, of uh, academic achievement. So that's how we get. That's how we came together. That's awesome. So, Joe, where are you from originally? So I'm Portland, Oregon. Um, okay. Born and raised, really, just right across the river in Vancouver, Washington. Um, most of my working career was crossing the river into Portland on different startups kind of around Nike. And uh, yeah, we were, we had some success. We scaled those companies and we were, we were acquired by publicly traded companies. And then it went on to say, I want to do my own thing. And uh, just waiting for that opportunity to take all the lessons learned previously and then to be able to apply those. And so that's the journey we're on. So, so Joe, tell everyone, tell the audience um, about on DM. Explain on them how you came up with the, the idea to, to, to build this business. Share that. 
Okay, oh, it's another story. I can, it can, you may need to interrupt me if I start rambling on. But so on DM, the key thing about on DM is just in the name itself, right? It's three words combined uh, to make the brand name of on DM. It's on demand. Everybody wants everything on demand right now. You think of, we have like Amazon Prime shows up here every single day. Uh, the dogs bark, they knock, right? And they're dropping off practice because you can get it right fast, right? Um, Netflix, everybody wants things to download, stream, uh, Uber, access. Everybody right now uh, is, we're spoiled, right? We can get everything at, with our fingertips as a consumer on our phone and get it fast. Mm -hmm. So that is what's needed for any service or product to be successful. In, in a service business with staffing and everything else, as it's grown over, over decades, um, I, I had used other kind of gig economy marketplaces. I used Rover.com for my dogs. We used Care.com for like nannies and babysitters and stuff like that. In the previous business we were at, so, so let me go back. On DM stands for on demand, uh, per diem and staffing. Uh, you know, I think, you know, all about people. You guys did staffing for nurses and that stuff. Um, uh, a, in a staffing assignment in healthcare is referred to a lot of times as a per diem, as a per diem shift. And then most importantly, Carpe diem, right? This opportunity for this clinical staff or somebody that that is committed to this field that they're studied in, they're passionate about, but they're only working a couple of days a week and they want to go earn a little bit of extra money in a field. They don't want to go sell Mary Kay and Amway and a bunch of MLM BS, right? They don't want to buy a bunch of crap that they have to inventory to go sell as they want to contribute to their household. What if you can earn money? In a, in, in a space that you're passionate and knowledgeable about and you can do what you love on demand. So that's on DM. So going out and then, uh, so on this journey, the previous company we were at, um, you know, we're, we're, we're a product manufacturing company. In the meantime, I have one of my good friends who's a dentist and he's talking about all the challenges that they have on being able to provide care to their patients. Essentially, when we think of any business monetization and sales, a dental practice is a small business and you're, you're not selling product. You're doing, you're doing procedures and treatment for oral health care. It's either cleanings or crowns or root canals, basic stuff, but well, it's not basic, but it's just those common things. But you can't, if your clinical staff doesn't show up to work, you can't treat your patients. Therefore you're not billing insurance companies and you're not bringing in revenue. It's tough to, grow that practice and take care of your patients. So your sales are actually your, your procedures that you're doing. Your sales reps essentially are your dentists and your hygienists. Dental assistants contribute a, a big role too in assisting that. But you know, if there's no doctor and there's no hygienist, what are they assisting? They can't do some of those procedures. So the, the overall rate limiter of success for that practice is the clinical staff. So as my buddies chirping in my ear talking about, I can't find people. I can't find people. Blah, blah, blah. Well, why did they leave? Well, you, I would hear, well, she wanted health insurance. You mean she's a healthcare provider, but doesn't have healthcare herself. Well, that's kind of jacked up. That doesn't make sense. That's not right. So give her health insurance. Well, if I give her health insurance, I'm going to have to give all my other employees health insurance. What do you mean? Your employees don't have health insurance. I uncovered that this labor pool is all part-time employees, not all of them, but 50% of this clinical staff are part-time employees systemically over the last four decades when hygienists and dental assistants and sometimes doctors that didn't own the practice, they wanted to work part-time. You know, in the eighties and nineties, it was great to have a high hourly earning potential and then still be able to be part of raising your kids on some days of the week. Well, who knew that over decades that that establish this infrastructure of all these part-time workers. So if you talk to a hygienist, you're like, Hey, you work full-time. Yeah. One practice or two practices. Oh, I work full-time at two practices, Mondays and Wednesdays at Dr. A's and Tuesdays and Wednesdays at Dr. B's. So they're not consistently with the same employer. So therefore they're not hitting the 30 hours a week mandatory to receive healthcare benefits mm -hmm. and doctors manage them and, and, and throttle their hours. So they don't have to do that, which is hurting their own growth. So that was the light bulb moment, right? If we could build a, a, an ecosystem in a marketplace that could be on demand clinicians with these practices that want to take care of their patients, we can help people, we can help these practices grow. We can help these clinicians earn more money. 
and we can bring compliance and consistency and in, through technology and leverage of scale, we can do it at an affordable rate. So that's the thesis. And actually, we're doing it right now. And it's pretty awesome. Wow. That was a lot. Sorry, I threw that a lot out there. No, it was great, Joe. It no, it, it is great. So, you know, you, you're tackling an issue that has had a lot of whispers around that. You know, I'm working the hours, but I'm not seeing the benefit of a full-time employee, right? So there's a problem-solving element to what you're doing. Um as it popularizes, what are you finding is the biggest challenge for you in this business? Ooh, that's a great question. Yeah, I mean, so, so right now, Charles and I took a couple bets on mm-hmm. the direction we wanted to go with it. And those bets were more money to build the tech, yeah. um, more expense for us as a solution compared to a competitor, but we just felt it was the right thing to do. Yeah. But, we can't just build a matching match.com of dentistry just to connect people and have them go work. And, and then their, their contractors are the 1099 and we don't have to do those benefits. But the, the, the opposite of that is you now have to become not only just a, a, a match.com gig economy marketplace like Uber, but you also have to be a payroll company similar to paychecks and ADP, you build a whole HR stack in order to make them your employees and establish and set up shop in every single state and get workers comp and on all, that's why I said, Charles, I don't know how the hell to do this. Can join us, help me out, right? And so, so in that endeavor, now the challenge is education. It's educating this dental practice, our value, like what's our value proposition to them and, and, and ex- ex- educating them on the risk if they don't use us and why it's a little more expensive in the short term, but it's actually more cost effective in the long term. And it's actually more competitive than you even realize. And so what's beautiful about a start company, a startup tech company is no different than like uh, any kind of sports team. You go run a play. Oh, wait, that play, that didn't work. Like we got sacked or we didn't score. or It was good in, on our paper as we drew it out, but let's come up with another play. Yeah. So as we're launching new features and functionality, our customers are giving us feedback and it's listening to that feedback. And it's so critical right now we have about 25 team members and Charles and I have created one of this. We didn't create it. We just set out for people that fit our, our, uh, our personality types. And Charles had one rule when I said, Hey, we join me and help me out. He had one rule. Charles, are you cool saying your rule? Uh, no assholes. No assholes. Like if, if we get a chance to choose people that we're going to work with every single day, that we're going to be more around them more than our own family, man, we don't want them to be assholes. So the great thing about that is we're surrounding ourselves with people who are open-minded, they're inclusive, they're, they're passionate and throw ideas out. It's everybody has ideas. Um, I'll share one little side story about this. Um, if, if you don't mind is there's, there's, I'll send you guys the link of this. There is a TED Talk speaker that speaks to about organizations and change and inclusivity. Charles, did I ever share this with you at all? No. About, no. And, and he references Steve Kerr. And when, when Golden State, that first year, when they, um, I think, were they playing Cleveland or whoever they beat in their first time when they, when they so many years back, you know, five or six years ago, the first time they won the championship. Um, so in this, and I'm not, I'm, I'm hacking this up. I'm not doing it justice for this story. It wasn't my story, but I just love this watching it. So in there, uh, I think they lost game one. They lost game two. They're in game three and there may be a way and they had the most wins ever. I don't know if they set a record that year for the most wins in the league or they tied it or maybe it was most wins for Golden State or something like that, but they were crushing it. But now they're in the playoffs. They're advancing. They're in the NBA finals and they're down two games. And they're in game three and they're losing and they're like, crap, you don't want to go down 0-3. I mean, that would be like if Charles and I were to play horse, best of five, Charles would be down 0-3 and it would not be good for Charles, right? So in this scenario, they're, they're down 0-2, about to go down 0-3. <laughs> and then he, they make a critical change. I don't know if they took Draymond Green out or they did something and they put some other person in who's riding the bench, not getting much playing time. That move went on to change the course of that game, and they won that game. They implemented that same for game 
four, one, and they went on to win the series. So they're doing an interview in a press conference and they go to um, Steve Kerr and they say, Steve, tell us about these changes that you moved because it looked like that change that you moved, made in game three, that was kind of the pivotal moment. Um, yes, I'm so sorry. I got a dog that's banging on my door. Hands again. So they, um, that, that change was the pivotal move that, that changed the momentum of everything. What was it that made you do that? And he goes, well, ironically, it wasn't me. And so the way that this, this TED Talk speaker goes, Steve Kerr came in with a vision and a mission to say, to change the culture of that organization. He wanted to change it to where everybody from the entire organization, I don't care if you're sweeping the floors to paying accounts payable to receivables to the, the C-suite executive team, we're all one team, one family, and everybody has a voice and everybody's inclusive in this change. So he created a culture where everybody felt they could speak up. They didn't feel like their idea wasn't going to get smashed down and not heard or passed on. So it created a, a, an atmosphere where, oh, yeah, I'm so sorry. One second. <laughs> That's a the podcast. But we're gonna have to edit. We're gonna have to edit that out right there. We're gonna edit that and just no, no editing. editing. No editing. We don't edit here. Part we're of the future. Of, they, we never edit, so this is good. This is good stuff. That's part of the future of work, right? We're all working from home, right? Jeez. Timing. That dog's quiet all day. He probably hears me in here. Okay, so what happened was this: is he's speaking on that Kerr created environment of inclusivity where people could speak up. That that made a like an assistant to the assistant to the assistant coach some guy he goes it wasn't my idea it was the assistant assistant coach greg uron or something like that that i said in a huddle what are you guys seeing that i'm not seeing he felt comfortable to speak up to say let's take out one of our starters and put in somebody else which is a bold move and he, he felt comfortable to do that and i trusted him so i made that move so it's not so what kerr went on to do in that press conference is when they asked him what was the move that he made he's so confident in his own ability he doesn't need to be a credit robber you know people talk about cradle robbers i hate credit robbers right people that want to take credit for other work that somebody did downstream just to make your bosses look good right so he's so confident. he's like he gave he goes well it wasn't my idea it was Greg Uron who recommended this change and he gave him all the credit. Like how beautiful is that, right? Well, I think Check there's three things. There's three things to that, Joe, which are super important, right? One is the, the fact that Steve Kerr listened to the idea first and foremost. You know, you don't have to be the guy with every idea. Secondly, to your point, that you create a culture where someone feels comfortable speaking up. That could have absolutely been a scenario where you could have asked that question in any other environment and no one said a word. Why? Because they don't think it's acceptable to do so, right? Even though someone may ask the question, the fact that this guy knew he really wants, he wants, he wants our input. I've got an idea. I got something I want to say that, that, that speaks volumes. And I think enough, enough organizations, more, more organizations don't do that, right? They're, they don't create that culture, which is, I think the biggest piece and which is the beautiful thing about on dam, the culture is so that people feel comfortable expressing their ideas and sharing their, their unique value that they bring to the organization. I've never experienced or seen anyone feel like they can't say what they need to say or should say or want to say to contribute value. Um, the last thing you're almost right. They did win 73 games to have the best record. They took over that the bulls had, they were 73 and nine, the bulls previous record was 72 and 10. But they lost the championship that year. Oh, they did. Yeah. Well, I'm just a basketball <laughs> story, and that's all. Sorry. But, but love, love, love the analogy, and I think it perfectly fits, you know, how you operate and how the business operates. Yeah, yeah. Well, to tie this full circle, so your question was, like, what are we seeing as a roadblock or challenges to, 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 to take us to the moon, right? And in that, we, we kind of asked that same sort of question to our team, our customer service team, our sales. We have a smaller sales team, but as we get this feedback 
And feedback came from our customers and it's kind of like a closed loop system. It came back and that feedback came in and I'm like, oh my gosh, that makes total sense. Part of us as us being a payroll company for these temps that now so we just, we match them up. It's all happens through software. They, they request shifts. It's all fully automated. It's like going to Airbnb and choosing a spot, but they choose a practice to go work at practices, choose if they want to accept them. They view their profile, just like LinkedIn, et cetera. And they connect to accept the shift and they go work the shift, et cetera. But it's in that connection when they see the rates and the pricing that they see our fee structure, they're like, Oh my God, that's a little high. Well, some of our team members were like, I also was an office manager one time at a practice. I didn't know what those fees were and what they meant. So it's listening to them like, oh, duh, that makes total sense. Like we didn't know this much about payroll until we built a kind of a payroll company, right? So why would we expect somebody who has no exposure, they're not a CPA, they're not a controller, they're not an HR to understand these costs. So listening to them and they're telling us what the objections are for people of that price structure, like, oh, well, let's, let's educate them. Let's show them at the point of sale, at the point of service, when they're using it, let's show them and break down. Don't just show on DM fee of 150 bucks. Show our little tiny fee of 40. And we include food attacks, suit attacks, social security, Medicare, all these workers comp, unemployment, all these other things that we're incorporating, which now they can kind of compare it to say, oh my gosh, that on DM temp is pretty comparable to their own employee who's out sick that day because they have those same labor burden cogs on that same in person. So it's just, so to close that full circle was we we've launched a bunch of new functionality that educates our users right now at the point of sale when they're doing that. And we're having, I think this month we're going to get up 260% over last year, same month, last month we were up 210% the month before that. So once we made this change back in July, now our customers are seeing our pricing model is very transparent. We actually called that feature clear pay. You can you're, you clearly understand what you're paying for. So we're excited to see the tailwinds of that. And now it's about educating people and getting just awareness of what we're doing. So Joe, um, obviously, you know, early on you talked about this entrepreneurial spirit that you know is inside of you. At what point in life? did you discover how important that was to you and something you couldn't deny? That is a good question. That is good. Um, well, I, I, let's see. Part of it, I knew early on. So the, the previous company that I had worked at, they had a VP of sales who was awesome. Like he was, you know, you talk about these role players within these roles, you put them in, like he could rally the people to, smile and dial and motivate them and encourage them to do that. He would hire certain, I would call them, come and call them like an avatar, certain individuals that fit a certain type of profile. And this is not the best. This is terrible. So this is eighties or nineties when he was nineties, eighties and nineties when he was doing this, he would hire typically people that from like LA fitness or what are those other uh, 24 hour fitness. And his, he felt that they were in very good physical shape, that they had pride in themselves, which was true, that they would take care of themselves and that they were aggressive. And he would say, whether it's a male or a female, if you can, if you have the confidence enough to go talk to the opposite sex, to pick up on them and hit on them or whatever, that you believe in yourself and you're outgoing. So if you can go out and uh, meet people and date people, that you have the common. So that's all he would look at. Mm. So he was very superficial as far as I was. I feel bad. Hopefully he doesn't watch this. I love the guy, but if he, um, in his, his hiring practices. And so I walked into a room of a bunch of sales reps and it was like a bunch of clones of 15 or 20 guys that were all the same. You know, they had, what does it call it? Jim tan or whatever. Right. They were, you know, they, they, they were, they were doing the curls for the girls or whatever else it is. And they were all for themselves. And I would hear them on the phone call and they were calling people and they'd hang up, they'd get objection for no. And they'd call the next person, the next person, the next person. And they'd, they'd sell some stuff. They'd sell one or two items. We had a whole catalog of things. They were just, I don't want to call them like one trick points. They were just focused on that. And they wouldn't ever think about the bigger picture and the bigger opportunity. And they were simply just saying 
the features and benefits of the product, right? Okay, hey, here's this feature. This is what it is, and here's the benefit to you, and that's it. But they wouldn't outgo beyond just telling what they're reading off of the script or reading off of the, the cut sheets. And I just kind of like nerded out. And I wasn't even nerdy with, I was bad at math and everything else, but I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. How does this work? What if it did this? And I would challenge her, what if we could do this? Because the customer wants to do this. And all of a sudden engineering would take my ideas and I was, and I would go to the sales. I, they, oh, I'd get these really big orders because those guys would get a hundred orders of one items and I would get 10 orders of a hundred items. And I really got to know that. And it was at that moment I was like, damn, I'm kind of good at this. Like I'm kind of good at, you know, solving these challenges and figuring out how to grow. Then they, uh, they went and they sold that company. They started up another company that came over there and I just, in that moment, I found out, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm good at this. I'm good at uh, product differentiation, good at go-to-market strategies. Is it B2B? Is it B2C? Is it B2B to C? And all these different things. Simultaneously, I kind of like the product functionality and tech to innovate things for efficiencies. So it was in that, I was in my, it was probably my early 30s. But I will tell you, I, had, I did have um, imposter syndrome for a while. Mm. Uh, like, I, I don't have the pedigree of academics. I can't even spell academic, right? I, like, I'm a terrible speller. Um, so part of those things kind of affected me a little bit as far as me really putting myself out there. But then I would see individuals who were credit robbers. They would, like, take my ideas because they would be a product manager or a business manager of a division. And they would have great pedigree of stuff. And I would see them get stumped. Like something would come up, some objection. And they're like, oh, I guess we're not going to do that. I'm like, what the hell? What do you mean? That's one objection, man. Because we can do it a different way. Let's figure out a different way to do it. We can get around that. And I don't know if we can. Like just very robotic, right? And it was in that moment I was like, no. I'm not letting this go. This is something we can take this, we can figure this out. And so it was in that moment, that's in my mid early thirties, I kind of figured that out. I just had to wait until my moment came up. And then my wife, um, her father um, had this dream that he was in a, he was this awesome Italian guy, he did some amazing things. Like he uh, was a professor, He an Italian guy from New York city, from Boston. Um, went out west uh to he started a, a a small university out here in oregon um, when he was at boston he went and walked with martin luther king across the summer bridge and they called people to come down there just like very awesome human being and he was also an entrepreneur and did real estate and some stuff but he had this goal to retire to 55 or 60 and he finally retires shortly after he gets als and unfortunately yeah. you know passes away um but he had all these things that he wanted to do but was waiting for the time when the time was right to do these things you never want to live like totally like yolo but he never got a chance to do some of these things that he wanted to do so when i had this idea to start on dm and i was telling my wife about it she's like right, if you don't do it are you gonna regret it right and she goes we're not gonna teach our kids to live with regret and we gotta do it and i was like Oof, we got a really cush executive job right now that's steady payroll. Um, and so, yes, yeah, she, I think she, if it wasn't for her to encourage me and also to support, um, cause one of the things I just recently heard is, you know, my hair wasn't gray four years ago or, you know, it was not, I'm going to look like Steve Martin here pretty soon. My hair is going to be all white. That's how it's going to be ugly. It's, and in that it's stressful. Right. And so you have the highs and the lows of this journey. And what somebody had just told me, I said, hey, listen, one of the things, Joe, as I've seen your wife with you at these events is as you're on this journey, it's really hard and emotional for you. And you go through those highs and lows and it's, uh, it's emotional. It's, it's twice that with your spouse. Because not only is she going in parallel with you on these journeys, but she's, she's feeling those same emotions, but she's also supporting you and encouraging you on your highs and lows. So she's like, she's feeling it twice. So um, I just wanted to mention that because it is part of this, right? As you, when you go on this road, who's ever with you in the car, they're on the road too. And you're yeah. just driving along and they're on, they're on it. And so, uh, but I wouldn't change it for any. I love it. 
So, Joe, I know there's so much more to you than just, um, you know, the CEO, Joe, and, and the, the business. I know you're a proud father and obviously devoted husband. You have a very successful uh, family just in general. I know your brothers are, have been successful in life. Tell us a little bit about those that are around you and um, you know, how they contribute to you. Hmm. You know, yes, you guys are. Have you guys done this before? You guys are pretty good at your questions. You guys are pretty We're good. Kind of new at this thing. We're trying to. Figure <laughs> you, out. you guys are pretty good. Um, yeah, I mean, well, I think it's interesting. So I'm, I turned fifty two months ago, and there were there were different phases of my life where I had lots of friends, and then sometimes no friends at all, and then lots of friends and stuff. And as I got in my early mid twenties, when I got kind of obsessed with business and scaling and working, like. People say you're a workaholic, whatever it is. It's like, man, working is my hobby too. If you love what you do, like, like, I mean, I'm not, if I was, I, I don't, I'm not a fisher or a hunter or, you know, I don't, you know, I don't work. I know you just probably think I work out every day, but I don't, you know. <laughs> um, so within all of that, like, I don't really have hobbies, but I love what we do for work. And so part of it, and so, so it was, t- it was tough to, to, to draw the line to separate work from hobby because it's just fun on what we're doing and it's exciting. But in those timeframes, when you get obsessed with that, you kind of start close. If if people get, Hey Joe, you want to go see a movie? Hey Joe, you want to go to a game? Hey, you know, you want to go to the blazer game? You want to do this? And you always say no. Well, you stop getting those invitations, right? So for me, I had a good core family. My father um, was a super hard worker, worked his way up, you know, success. Um, up at U.S. Bank, um, but he did it through hard work. I mean, he worked his ass off. My mom was a nurse for 40 years, and she just loved everybody and cared for everybody. It didn't matter who you were. Like, come in. Like, you need food. Come on. She just helped everybody. Like, we would pay for – they weren't wealthy by any means, but we would pay for some of our friends' colleges at the time. We'd have our friends in high school move in with us if they got kicked out or whatever else it is just as a temporary place. So they instilled those kind of – you know, companies have core values. We would also have, like – just our families, you know, here's what you do. Here's how you treat people, right? Just treat people with kindness. And if we didn't, we got out of line. We were, you know, you heard the stories about parents spanking kids with the belt. Oh, I met Mr. Belt many a times when I was a kid, if you got out of line. So they, they instilled that. I mean, part of this right here, you can see right here, this says, um, you can see this is, be truthful, gentle, and fearless, right? That's kind of on DM's culture. Truthful, fearless. Um, and, and gentle just because in today's there's so much trauma with everything right the political system um, the the economy the, is there going to be in a recession global warming right? you, everything right now is so polarized and there's no there's, so everybody's going through some level of trauma to some degree and some degree of anxiety let's just be kind right let's just take care of people so how can we implement that it's kind of, so that was kind of instilled by my parents my parents really, you know, you get out of life what you put into it. So don't complain if you don't like the results of what you have because it's all on you. You can, you know, so it was kind of that. As time progressed, um, I started missing community a little bit. I started missing, you know, friends and buddies and stuff like that. And it, once that um, kind of in in my 40s uh, or late 30s and 40s, uh you kind of find your core people, your core friends. And it's, you know, you would hear the cliches of, you know, birds of a feather flock together. Are you, you know, whoever you surround yourself with, you kind of embody and kind of become. And I knew that uh, I hate negativity, man. I hate it. I can't stand, like, I want to cut the negativity out in anything. It's just toxic, right? So if it's your friend and they're constantly complaining and bitching or nagging or gossiping, I don't want to be around. And so then you just, it's weird. You just kind of manifest or draw or attract people through laws of attraction. The people that are like-minded that are, they want to do things and go places and, and, and have fun and not be so uptight, but also not be assholes. Right. Once I kind of recognize that and realize that it's just, you started meeting like-minded people and then they become your friends and your peers. And, um, that's kind of the people that I've been surrounding myself with over the last 10 to 15 years. And, um, it's, I love it actually. 
So um, we talked a little bit about sport. Growing up, uh, were you an athlete? Did you consider yourself an athlete? And then when you think about sport, what role did that have in terms of your self-confidence to be the businessman that you are today? That's another good question. Jeez, good another good one? That's another good question. Thank well, you. I'll tell you this. My password forever used to be prime time because I felt I was a dual sport athlete like yeah. Dion. I, I love Dion, man. I loved it just because like uh, – now, yeah, so I had four brothers. I mean, three brothers. We're the four Fog Boys. I was a twin. My brother, a year and a half older, another brother, uh, four years older. We were so competitive. We would play basketball all day, every day, until the neighbors got irritated with the ball bouncing in the cold. Sack. We would play football all the time. Me, I was, um, I graduated at 17, so I was a little smaller. Um, when, I, when I went, I did play, I played soccer. I played football, basketball, baseball, and soccer. We played all sports every year. So I get my, I don't know how the hell my parents did it. They had four boys all in different sports. Every, every season we we're in whatever sport of that season was. And all of us, different teams, different practices, all of it. Now they were shuttling us all around. I think that was critical mm-hmm. now because I learned what I, on a team. I learned to listen to the coach. I learned if I sucked, I wasn't going to play. I learned that in order to get better, I had to practice. I learned that, um, you know, I mean, am I an athlete? I think Charles is soon going to find out that I'm an athlete. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sorry, I keep going. I keep going to that. Um, but I, uh, it was, it was <laughs> that's part of the psychological game right now. That's part of it. It's meant, it's, there's a mental and a physical. He's going to, you know, he, I, I'm sure he's got a good physical shot. Mentally is where I'm going to win against Charles. Oh, probably, wow. Okay. Probably, probably not. <laughs> That's part of it. This is part of it. So, um, but actually, I, um, my brothers were all bigger than me. So I, I got, so when we were playing, you know, we'd always play 21 and bump and two on two, pick up games and all that kind of stuff all the time. Well, then my senior year in high school, uh, I, I didn't grow big enough to play football or basketball. And I didn't have, I wasn't as, I was terrible with my left hand. I'm not anymore though, Charles. So now you just don't know, right? So in that, what happened was I, I learned that I was, um, I, I started playing around other kids that were no longer my brothers who were just physically bigger and all that stuff. And I, and I was, I was winning. I was doing pretty good. So I went to school at Central Washington University. I was going to play soccer there. Uh, at that time, I was 17. I went, I just turned 18 right in August, right before the freshman season started. And they were all awesome. I know it's soccer. It's not football and basketball, but there was a, that next level of the collegiate level was night and day shift. I was like, I was a boy playing against men. So then we played intramurals and there was a couple hundred teams of intramurals. Me and my twin brother, others, we had a team called the fog. We actually made it to the championship. We lost to the basketball, the football team. So I learned there that um, you get out of what you put into it, right? It's, it's the commitment. What is that? Is there a rule like the 10,000 hour rule or whatever that is? If you do mm-hmm. anything that yeah. mean. So we we did that not knowing we we're doing that. Like we were playing basketball every single day, shooting free throws. We, we played three pointer games, all these different things. Um, I loved football. Uh, I loved I loved being the quarterback in our in our intramural team. I didn't have the strongest time to throw bombs, but I, I could, I could, my approach was more like Michael Vick, right? I thought I could be speed around the outside. We could, we could do options and we could option throw and we, we don't, we'd make up so many stupid trick plays. You would think we were trying to be the Harlem Globetrotters of the damn intramural flag football team. And we were trying to do things to like confuse the other team, but that was fun. So I think you're right. I think it was doing those things at that stage. Now I've never even thought about or connecting that dot. It was that stuff because there I had to like, all right, everybody, you got to pay your, you, you got to pay your, your dues because we're playing in rooms. Okay, everybody, the game's here. Okay, the time. I, I, I inevitably became like the manager or the leader or the coach without wanting to be it because everyone else was either too busy partying in college or whatever else to want to go and register the team and get us all. So I knew that, hell, if they weren't going to do it, I'm going to do it. Absolutely. So like, I'm going to do it. Then I'm going to choose. I'm going to be quarterback. Like unless somebody else was awesome. I'm like, okay, you can be quarterback. So I think you're right. I think it was doing those things 
that helped me in this where I'm at now. So, Joe, you remember when you got to Central Washington <laughs> and <laughs> you got to soccer and you, you realized it was men versus boys. You remember that? I think I know where you're going. Yeah. <laughs> Keep that in mind. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna have to do part two of this, okay? Yeah. So, so Charles and I are fifty-fifty in a horse right now. Oh. and I'm a really? football player. Yeah, we're only fifty-fifty in horse because he beat me at my house when I'm like, I got a bad back, and and I haven't had an ACL since he, I was twenty-six like, years he old. He felt like he needed to get a win in. So that's I haven't reason. had an ACL since I was 26 years old. It doesn't matter. You, he never knew that. I never had an ACL. I don't like to lose, Paul. <laughs> yeah, okay. Fall. And if you're a jump shooter, right, you have no jump shot because you can't jump. With the, guess with what the he's ACL. telling you when he says he hates to lose. Guess what he's telling you. He's lost. You're a smart man, Joe Fall. A basketball player shouldn't beat me. <laughs> <laughs> so you played football? I was a football player growing up. Yeah. What position did you play? Wide receiver, free safety. Ooh, jeez. Yeah. So, you know what? Neither here nor there. Um, do you ever come to Phoenix, Scottsdale? Yeah. Charles has a beautiful backyard. It happens to have he a He knows. He's been there. there. Yeah, I've been yeah. There. No, yeah. he's been there. Oh, he's been there? been there? Yeah, he knows. We'll have to get a little. It'll be fun. I... It'll be beautiful, man. It'll be beautiful. No, it won't. So, what I heard is. Well, here's what I just heard, okay? Just to repeat it back. I heard Charles' home court advantage didn't help. Charles' home court. Yeah, home court advantage. Home did, I court. Hear, did I hear, like, something about a back or maybe that the back maybe threw a Affected your shot. Or All of a sudden, we had a back issue. Just <laughs> telling the truth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm just telling the truth. That, that back issue flared up after that game was over. Just <laughs> telling the truth. <laughs> <laughs> some, people, some people like to take advantage of situations. Yeah. I'm, just, yeah. I'm just telling the truth. That's yeah. All. You know, yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Why well, is I did hear? Um, I met Charles's cousin. I think it was in Washington D.C. And I hope you were there for this, Charles. And he told me because you were saying that you were saying Charles, like this guy can shoot. And that guy looked at me and goes, "I can shoot like he could shoot." And he said it with just like pure conviction about Charles shooting. I'll say, I'll tell anybody, Charles can. Charles will tell you, Charles can shoot. The problem, Fog, is I hate to lose. <laughs> Yeah. Sometimes that doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so sometimes you make it about something else. You make it about just little real basic stuff. Left hand layups, opposite hand layups. Now I'm not I'm not trying to give you any Yeah, he's giving you yeah. a recipe. <laughs> he's giving you a recipe man. right now. Yeah. Well yeah, Charles, I'm not gonna go with your basic okay, we're gonna do a three point shot from the wing. I'm gonna bounce it in the air, catch it in the air. Lay in or something basic that I know that, 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 uh, that your typical 59 year old can do. That's what I'm going to do. Hey, wait, wait, wait. I'm not 59, by the way. I don't want you know, anybody to get the wrong idea around here. It sounds like the table is set, man, for uh, this fall. It's not set. In, in Arcadia. So that would be fun. Do you guys live close by each other? Three, Two three minutes. <laughs> oh, yeah, real close. What, what made you guys decide to, to start this podcast? This is really kind of... Well, like I told Brian Eccles earlier, listen to the podcast. You'll find out. The very first no, one. I'll be nice and tell you. <laughs> <laughs> He's being ornery. You, you've challenged him. He's being ornery. I've listened to some of them. I have, but I don't... I mean, I just tuned that out, I guess. You know, man, literally sitting in Charles' backyard and then eventually my backyard. Too much tequila, Joe. Tequila. And an Bourbon. idea, and I pressed on him a little bit. I'm not gonna kid you. He, he, first, he was lukewarm. Second time, yeah, you know what? Okay, had everything set up. Now we here. came to the studio, and it's been beautiful since. Yeah, well, I can tell you this: yeah. um, I have never met anybody like Charles before. Never. Um, oh, man. Likewise. My, like our team, they, they they literally crave crave time for Charles. 
And it's so interesting to, it's kind of fun watching Charles have conversations with our team or with anybody. Cause as me, as I've just been rambling speaking too much, probably on this podcast, Charles is such a good listener and he listens to listen. He doesn't listen to like, I can't help my damn ADHD, ADD brain when somebody's telling me a cool story and they say something and that, like, oh, that just made me trigger a thought. Now I'm still listening in the intent to listen because I really want to be present and I'm not listening to wait for they finish so I can tell that story because I'll probably forget about it. But Charles just listens and then he'll, he'll engage in rhetorical conversation about what he listened to and speak to it. And you can just see the person. Sometimes it's like, man, people don't listen to me the way you listen to me, Charles. Like, can I talk? It's almost like like a therapist or something. It's so great to watch. It's because you're always talking these delusional things about what you can do <laughs> on the basketball court. You got to work on that. Okay. Yeah, but this is one we can we can solve very soon. So, uh, you know, we look forward to you coming down, and we'll we'll see where everybody is. Backs and ACLs. And, all we're going to go stuff. to a proper gym so I can take you both way outside your limitation. Okay. Yeah. I, I, think, young, I think that's young Charles. <laughs> that's young Charles, okay? <laughs> I, 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 I don't feel bad because he, he's the same age. I'm not worried about him. I'm, I'm, actually, I'm actually older than Charles. He is. He actually is. I'm the young one here. I feel like you guys know. You guys ever talked about things recently about like pre-COVID or post-COVID? I think there's young Charles and old Charles. I think we just got to, we got to, we got to just got to say, we're going to have to, it, they, they keep moving the three point line back. We, we, we'll go to the old three point line rules, Charles, <laughs> for this. I'm just kidding. I keep, I keep, I just let him keep talking. You just let him keep talking because he has no idea what he's dealing with. I don't know why. Like, like you're, you're going to probably, keep talking. I know you'll, you'll, you'll shoot the lights out. So I'm going to have to do some stupid trick shots. It's a shooter. Just to just to just to figure all that out. Say is bring it, bring your uh, bring your ATM card. That's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> oh no! That just that that just made me pucker a little bit. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> we take Venmo too. <laughs> well, Mister Fog, man, we can't thank you enough for spending your morning with us. We appreciate it. I appreciate the time and the conversation. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Charles. Thanks. Appreciate you, brother. Glad you were on uh, Last Guest Season 3. You just made history. And uh, thank you for joining us on The Conscious Vibe. Thank you for joining us. And check us out on tcvpodcast.com. <laughs>